Hello, welcome back. In this video, I'll explain how to plot pixels on the layer 2 display of the Spectrum next. Along the way, we'll learn about memory banking, how the CPU addresses data, and even get to program a DMA controller. We're doing a lot more than merely poking values into RAM or looking at pretty colours, so stay tuned. Layer 2 is a screen mode unique to the Spectrum Next. It is 256 by 192 pixels in size, and each pixel is 8 bits. This gives us 256 colours. Additionally, the screen is treated as one block of memory, rather than being like the original Spectrum's interleaved display. The screen consumes 48k of memory, however, which is nearly all of the 64k address space the Z80 has. Considering the ROM code takes 16k, it sounds like this screen is unusable, as there'd be no room for code as well. However, there is a way to make this work. The Z80 CPU, on which the Next is based, has a 16-bit address bus. This means it can only address 64k of memory. The Spectrum Next has a memory mapping that is similar to the 128k Spectrums. Memory is split into four 16k slots, with the ROM being in slot 1. If you watch my video about the Z80, we saw it executes code from memory location 0 when you turn the power on, and that's slot 1. Slot 2 is used for various housekeeping things, and slot 3 is where our code is put when running, memory location 8000 in hex. This doesn't seem to give us much room to do anything. Trying to put a 48k screen into RAM would fill it all up. It has a few tricks that we can use, and one of them is memory banking. The next comes with one or two megabytes of RAM, and the trick is to choose which 16k bank from that we want, and then to map it into a specific slot according to what we're trying to do. This works really well with the screen. The layer 2 screen is 48k, so rather than trying to make it all fit into the address space in one go, it is split into three 16k banks. Each bank is 256 pixels across and 64 pixels down. There's a control register in the next where we decide which of those three banks is mapped into memory. Later we'll see this makes addressing individual pixels incredibly easy. So where exactly in the address space do we put the screen? If you remember from the memory map, most of the memory has a purpose, and overwriting any of it feels like it's going to destroy something important. Well, we do something a bit unexpected. The screen can be mapped into slot 1, which is where the ROM is, with the ROM still being in there as well. Yes, slot 1 contains the ROM, but this is where a clever trick called write-only paging is used. ROM, by its definition, is read-only. Under normal circumstances, trying to write to the bottom of memory doesn't do anything, and this can be exploited for our benefit using a technique called write-only paging. Write-only paging is a system where the next will treat the bottom 16k of memory specially. Reading from it will give us whatever is in the ROM, but writing will be directed to whatever bank we've mapped in. In our case, this is a piece of the screen. So now we've got an idea of what's going on, how do pixels actually get plotted? Since the display is 256 pixels wide, a 16-bit value can easily address any part of the screen. The top 8 bits can be the vertical position, and the lower 8 bits can be the horizontal position. There's a small bit of logic required to work out from the coordinates which third of the screen we're trying to bank in, but that's also quite easy to do. The nice part of this is that video memory is part of system memory so writing into it is no slower than putting data into any other part of RAM, and there's no need to call any special update routines to copy the display anywhere else. You just have to write bytes to memory locations and it appears straight on the screen. So if we write in bytes, how do we define colors? The pixels are defined as an 8-bit RGB, with 3 bits for red, 3 bits for green, and 2 bits for blue. So all we need to do is take the individual RGB values and shift them into the correct parts of the bytes. The only limitation is the range of values that we can use for the colors. The red and green values can be between 0 and 7, 
but the blue can only be between 0 and 3. Due to what we're considering as video memory being in RAM, it needs clearing first and it's generally a good idea to clear it after every frame. Otherwise you'll end up with previous frames being drawn on top of the next one. The memory that we're using isn't actually video memory. There's just a pointer inside one of the next registers that tells the next where video memory is supposed to be. And that's all we're moving and manipulating. So to clear the memory, we have a couple of options. The most simple way is a basic for loop that just plots a black pixel to every single position. It works, but it's incredibly slow. If you try it though, it's a good way to properly understand how the screen's organized. You'll understand where all the pixels are and that it's just one big massive bitmap. A better way is to think of the memory as just a chunk of RAM, which is all it is. We just want to set a large chunk of RAM to be a specific value. It doesn't really need to be pixels and colors, it's just a piece of memory. We want to probably zero it out. In C, we'd use memset. Here's the assembly that the compiler generates though. If you go and search the internet for Z80 routines for quickly setting memory to zero, you'll find this code. It's pretty standard. The Z80 has a specific instruction for repeatedly copying bytes, and that's all we're using. And on the next, if you try this, it fills your screen with colourful garbage. It doesn't actually clear it off. So why does this happen? Well, the way the code works is that HL stores the location to write to, DE contains the next location, and BC is the length of memory to write to, so BC is a counter. The LDIR instruction repeatedly does a copy from the address in HL into the address in DE, followed by decrementing BC until that becomes zero. The end result is some colourful mess all over the screen. It's quite interesting to look at and is another example of where I started to learn something new. Going through this code, I've just been almost assuming this is a C computer and that I just write C code that I've known for the past 30 odd years, but actually I really need to understand the machine I'm typing into. So why do we get this funny colourful mess? Well, it happens because memset is actually copying bytes rather than setting them. That's how LDIR works. And because we're using write-only paging, trying to read the previous pixel actually reads a byte from ROM. So the image on the screen is a copy of the first 16K of ROM. So without some extra effort, this way won't work at all. It's also something really hard for a compiler to warn about. Z88DK is a general Z80 compiler. It's not specific for the next. So it doesn't understand what write-only paging is. And in fact, that'd be quite hard for a compiler to know. It's a bit context sensitive. So this is yet another reason to understand how your machine works. And it seems a bit daunting having to deal with all of this when you're just trying to write pixels, but it's actually really interesting. I like this bit of coding where something goes wrong and I have to start understanding what I'm doing. It's too easy just to copy and paste code that you find on the internet. When it works, move on to something different. Getting down into the details is really quite interesting. This is also why I'm trying to make these videos. They're a bit of a prompt for me if I forget what I'm doing, but I also know it's quite frustrating trying to understand why things don't work. It's hard asking questions if you don't know what you're looking for. So maybe these videos are useful to other people. Leave a comment below if you've got any other of these subtle tricks and things that you know about that might be useful. So what do we do then? We want to clear the screen. Memset doesn't work properly and a for loop is too slow. And yet you see games where the screen gets cleared. So clearly something is being done. Well, don't worry. We'll just learn another complex part of the next. We'll learn how to use a DMA controller. And again, I really wasn't setting out to learn about DMA. I had that as something in the future to worry about. I just want to draw some pixels on the screen and to get used to the hardware. Well, I'm getting used to the hardware because I'm trying to perform something I want to do. I want to put pixels on the screen and I need to learn how to make it work. It seems quite complex, but if you know where to go for help, it's not that bad. A lot of the information I've found came from the Spectrum Next Wiki. It's manual, which is really well written, and the nice helpful people on Discord server. I've put links to all those things in the description. So DMA, if you didn't know, means direct memory access. It's a separate piece of hardware, which at the moment is simulated inside the FPGA, but if it was a real chip, there'd be one on the screen now and I'd be pointing at it. It's actually based off an actual DMA controller that exists for the Z80. What the DMA really is, is a state machine that's programmable. What we can do with it is tell it some basic pieces of information, 
poke it, and then off it goes, doing our instructions repeatedly, completely separate to the main CPU. We can tell it the following things. A source memory address and destination memory address. An amount of data to copy, and whether to do it once or repeatedly. By using this, we can easily wipe the whole screen clear insanely quickly. Well, for a Z80 based system at least. The DMA is controlled by registers and its setup is a bit weird. It's best to check the manual and the wiki to understand it properly. I might explain it in a future video. Normally the DMA has two pointers, one to a start address and one to a destination address. After each copy, the addresses are incremented. It has another way of working though, which is where you don't increment the source address, it just stays fixed. So it'll keep copying the same memory location repeatedly. We can use that to empty the screen. So all we do is set a byte of memory somewhere to be our background color and tell the DMA controller, copy this single byte 16,384 times, starting from memory location zero. When it's finished, we bank in the next part of the screen and repeat. If you do it three times, you've cleared the whole screen without using the CPU. It seems like a lot of effort and the code looks really strange, but it's very, very fast. In fact, in my completely non-scientific experience of just watching it, I've decided that it's faster than my C line drawing routine can draw a line on the screen. Once I've figured out how to use this, because I have a feeling I can use it for more interesting things than just wiping the screen, I'll make another video that explains it. But for now, I'm quite happy that I read some documentation. Without any help, I managed to get it to make the screen go black. So that'll do for now. So there we go. That's a look at how the layer 2 display works if you just want to plot pixels onto it directly. This isn't something you'd probably do when making a game. It's more something you do just for fun or to try and draw some patterns or just to learn about the machine. So what we've just covered is that the screen is 48k in size and it's split into three 16k pieces. We bank in a particular piece that we want to work on. The DMA controller is helpful in writing large chunks of colour onto the screen. Next time I'm going to look at the sprite system and how that works. The next has hardware sprites, so we get to play with more registers and obscure memory locations. I hope from this video you discovered that programming in C requires a little bit of understanding of assembly and also an understanding of what the hardware is doing. It's not like on a PC where you just need to learn C and some basic APIs. For this you really do need to understand the machine. However, by understanding the machine you start to learn what else you can do with it. I'm learning this as I go along, and these videos are my way of making sure I understand the theory. Before starting this, I didn't intend on learning about memory banking or DMA. I just figured I could poke some values into a memory location, they'd appear on the screen. Well, I've now learned two new things, which is really helpful. The next video also includes using a mouse, which is really unique and kind of strange in the way it works. And it had me hand disassembling mouse driver code from the 80s that I found on some old website. So if you want more of this kind of stuff where I'm trying to explain what I've learned and also digging around in extra things I didn't realize I was going to be learning, subscribe and do all that extra button clicking stuff that you know because this is a YouTube video. So until the next time, I'll see you later.